Welcome back everyone to the fourth and final part of the Resource War from Extra History. It's been a fantastic series. I feel like we've learned a lot. Uh, so as with all of the videos, the link is in the description to the original content as well as to the first episode of my reaction if you want to get caught up if you haven't seen the first three episodes. But let's go ahead and dive into Strategic Bombing. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Upon it depends our own British life and the long continuity of our institutions and our empire. The whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned on us. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be free and the life of the world may move forward into broad sunlit uplands. But if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age, made more sinister and perhaps more protracted by the lights of perverted science. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties, and so bear ourselves that, if the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say, this was their finest hour. Mm. Winston Churchill uttered those words on June 18th, 1940. So a couple of things about Churchill's finest hour speech there. First of all, remember, he's only been prime minister for a month at that point. The day he takes office as prime minister is the day that the Germans invade France uh, and start the really kind of start the war on the Western Front. Uh, because it had been what they called the phony war to that point. France and Britain had declared war on Germany uh, as soon as they attacked Poland in September 1939, but there really hadn't been any fighting on the ground on the Western Front. Uh, but the other thing is, notice he very specifically mentions the United States. One of Churchill's priorities was getting the U.S. involved in any way possible as quickly as possible. He understood that the, the British needed a strong ally in the U.S. and they needed the U.S. to get involved as quickly as they could. Now, you have to remember, you know, we take for granted what we call the special relationship, uh, this alliance that exists between the U.K. and the United States. But it wasn't that old at that point. Remember, the U.S. and the U.K. fight two wars, the Revolution and then the War of 1812. And even by the time you get to the First World War. There are a lot of Americans who were just as quickly ready to sign up for the side of the Axis in that war because there's a lot of German Americans as there were ready to fight on the side of the Allies. Uh, there was a lot of mistrust between the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, and so after World War I, that relationship starts to strengthen, starts to deepen. Uh, but it's still not the alliance we think of today. Three weeks later, the Battle of Britain would begin. And it truly was their finest hour. Yeah. One small island stood together against the greatest military force the world had ever known. And let's not forget that it wasn't just British. Uh, the best and most successful squadron in the Battle of Britain was a Polish squadron. And uh, incredible story that I think we'll have to dive into at some point. One last light of democracy stood burning against the fascist darkness. And as the darkness closed in, they fought to keep it burning with a resolve, a tenacity that no one in the world expected. And though the heroism of those exhausted air crews that day and night served as the steel wall of England deserve all the credit we can give them, this was a battle won by a nation. It was not only one in the sky over the English Channel. It was one in the radar stations that dotted the coast. It was one in the munitions factories and on the tarmacs. It was one in the research labs and in the code-breaking facilities. It was won by a people, not just a military. And everybody thought that those people would break. Someday I would love to dig into the full story of the Battle of Britain, as it is one mm. of the most powerful stories of modern history. But today, we 100%. want to tell it from a point at which it turned. From the point at which it stopped being a battle between two military forces, a battle which the fascists might have been able to win, to a battle of a military against a people. A battle the Nazis never had a chance at. It's the night of August 25th, 1940. A German bomber crew is flying over the English countryside. They've been tasked with taking out oil tanks at Rochester and at Thameshaven. But something's wrong. They've been flying too long, their fuel is low, and they still haven't seen their target. Should they press on? They've already passed the terrifying cordon of British air defense. They can't turn back now. But still, they see nothing. No, no, wait, there. There's something. Buildings. An urban area. This must be it. They open their bomb bay doors, and their bombs drop. 
But it wasn't the fuel reserves at Rochester and Thameshaven that bomber crew was flying over. Those bombs fell on London. They had bombed the biggest civilian center in the UK. There was outrage. Winston Churchill, assuming it was a deliberate attack, ordered a retaliatory strike on Berlin. These And even if it's not a deliberate attack, which there's no indication that it, it was, there's no proof of that, but uh, it's great propaganda when you tell your people it was a deliberate attack. Look at these evil Germans bombing our civilians, our cities. And every, every country's going to do this on either side. Uh, they're going to spin everything they can for the greatest psychological advantage they can get. These RAF bombers were supposed to target commercial and industrial targets, but they too missed their targets at yep. the cost of German civilian lives. And like that, the gloves were off. Hitler, who had previously ordered the Luftwaffe not to intentionally target civilians, now rescinded that command. And on September 7th, one of the largest coordinated bombing raids with nearly a thousand bombers spread out over 32 kilometers commenced. Their target? London, the heart of the British Empire. The idea was that if they could break the people of London, maybe they could break the empire itself. The Battle of Britain raged for months. German losses were mounting, but the RAF was also on the ropes. The hope on the German side was that this would be the knockout blow, that without enough air power to defend their major cities, the average citizen would lose faith in the government's ability to protect them and break. And this is also uh, an intentional strategy in lieu of a military invasion because they didn't have control of the, of the seas. The, the German Kriegsmarine was never going to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the British Navy, the Royal Navy. Uh, so they've got to win this in the air, and they've got to pu pummel them into submission to where they'll negotiate. And this probably would have been easier if Edward VIII was still king, because he was still he was much more willing to uh, kind of be more favorable toward the Germans, and we see that happening throughout the war. ...under the constant threat. The truth, though, was that if the Luftwaffe ever had a real chance of winning the Battle of Britain, it was right there on the week of the 7th by not attacking the populace. Hmm. The RAF was exhausted and worn down to the point where another week of concerted attack might, might have broken them. But instead, this massive diversion of resources to attack targets that didn't really reduce the RAF's capacity to fight gave them just the space they needed to come back and then smash the raids on London. On September 15th, Germany made one last push to break London, and instead was herself broken. In the massive air battle that ensued, with nearly 2,000 planes in the air over London, the Germans were repelled and re- I, I get that London is a huge city, and it is. It's, it's a wonderful city. I've been there a few times now. I'm going to be back there in a few days. Um, but could you imagine 2,000 bombers over any single place in the world? what that's got to do to your psyche and what that's got to do just in terms of the sheer number of bombs that were dropped. But that just shows you something about the British people, right? That, that this made them double down and gave them even more resolve rather than less. Man, that, something like that would scare the bejesus out of me. Reeling from recent defeats canceled their planned invasion of Britain. They came up with a new plan, one which doubled down on the strategy of breaking the civilian populace. They would abandon the struggle for control of the air and focus on a campaign of terror that every night when British air defenses were far less effective sent waves of German bombers to deliver a payload of destruction to the streets of London. But in the end, this massive diversion of resources took more away from the Nazi war effort than it ever did from the Allies, which historically is actually almost always what happens with air-based campaigns. And this is a great maybe diversionary opportunity to talk about an alternate history. What if the Germans continue to focus on military targets? Does this change anything with the Battle of Britain and with the outcome of the war? Great question. Since the dawn of aviation, it's been the dream of military strategists to win wars without ever putting troops on the ground. But short of the use of nuclear arms, it's practically never worked. Yeah. Whether it be the early attempts with Zeppelins in World War I, the Axis Blitz, or the Allied bombings of places like Dresden during World War II, the Napalm campaigns of Vietnam, or the modern conflicts in the Middle East. And the Blitz makes this fact clear. 
As the Germans pursued this strategy further and further, it became increasingly evident that the cost in men and material to the German forces exceeded the actual economic damage they were inflicting, even when their goal was primarily to just grind the British economy to a halt. And think about the aftermath of this then. This is kind of the height of German air power, and from this point on, now you're going to get concerted efforts by the Allies bombing the Germans on the mainland of Europe. And uh, it, it's a huge turning point in the war. As soon as the goal shifted toward breaking the will of the populace, the effect on wartime production became marginal at best. Month after month, British war production rose, and enlistment never slackened. And although nothing is as simple or as clear-cut as myth-making tends to make it, this also brought together the British people. As German bombs fell on London and casualties mounted, those with parents, siblings, and friends whose lives were cut short by the attacks didn't lose the will to fight. Quite the opposite, they instead became determined to never surrender. They threw... Th and I feel like this is a really great time to read a very well-known speech, or at least part of it. Nothing really encapsulates the spirit of the British people the way that famous speech from Churchill uh, in those desperate days in June of 1940, right? Where he basically says... There's no scenario in which Germany wins this war, even if they invade us, right? We will fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. And even if, which I do not for a moment believe, this island or a large part of it were subjugated and starving, then our empire beyond the seas, armed and guarded by the British fleet, would carry on the struggle until, in God's good time, the new world, with all its power and might, read America right there, United States, steps forth to the rescue and the liberation of the old. Churchill's always putting in those little hints for the U.S. to get involved and help that, help out. But man, I mean, have there been many speeches in human history that carried the weight and the power in the moment like that one did? ...themselves into the defense of Britain with a resolve that only comes from the deepest loss and were mm. prepared to make sacrifices that an unscarred population might never accept. You see, that's the thing about strategic bombing. Even when the objective is to strike industry or leadership targets, each civilian casualty, each incident of collateral damage, rather than breaking the enemy, just creates new groups who will forever oppose surrender. That's 100% true. I mean, can somebody give me an example, and I'm sure it's happened, can somebody give me an example in the comment section of a time when a terror campaign like this actually worked? to subdue a population rather than instill them with an even stronger resolve to fight back. And the Blitz also created a sense of national unity through shared struggle. Everybody who lived through the Blitz, rich and poor, shared a commonality that crossed many previous divides. And whether it was spending nights huddled together in a shelter, manning a civil defense gun, or working together on a volunteer fire crew, the Blitz literally brought people together. Mm. It made them understand each other and rely on each other as they'd never done before. And again, although nothing's ever as rosy as we remember, in the end, the Blitz did more to unify Britain than to divide it. And I think that concludes this look back at World War II. For now, anyway. I hope you folks enjoyed it. We'll see. Fantastic series. Really enjoyed it. I hope you guys did as well. If you have suggestions or requests for things you'd like to see me do reactions to, let me know in the comment section below. I'm recording a bunch of reaction videos ahead of time since I'm going to be uh, away for nine days uh, coming up here with the trip to Europe. Uh, but you will be seeing a lot of content coming from that as well as more videos from my recent Battlefield visit to Shiloh. Thanks for watching.